Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you. You've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and get some fire motivation from Kobe Bryant. There's a choice we have to make as people, as individuals. If you want to be great at something, you have to make inherent sacrifices that come along with that. Family time, hanging out with your friends. So at the age of 18, I knew that I was not going to be stopped. This was my life. We all can be masters at our craft, but you have to make sacrifices that come along with making that decision. Follow your passion first. Mm -hmm. First, 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 first. Um, when I retired from the game, you know, I said they're asking kind of all the wrong questions. You know, what's the biggest industry I can get into? And it's all the wrong stuff. And you got to sit there and ask yourself, okay, what am I truly passionate about? What do I enjoy doing? And when you feel that way, I, honestly, I mean, you feel like you have never worked a day in your life. It's the most fun thing in the world. You get up in the morning excited about what you're doing. And you got to be really honest with yourself about it. If you wake up in the morning and you're dreading going to work, dude, do something else. <laughs> right. Do something else. And those are hard decisions to make. But when you make those decisions, it's a very liberating experience. And you find out that the rewards will come. When I played, um, one of the things that I had to learn is how to get the best out of my teammates. Yeah. And most people think it's a simple thing. You know, pass them the ball. You know, but that's not how you make guys better. You have to really affect their behavior. How do you do that? So, you know, like, you know, I would tell guys... We got back-to-backs, you know, I don't care if we're in Miami, I don't care if we're in a great city of Chicago, we can't go out, we gotta get rest. Right? Back-to-back back games. Back-to-back back games, yeah. right? Monday, Tuesday, you play Monday and play again Tuesday. The guys aren't gonna listen, right? You don't, you know. Right. So a few times say, all right, we'll all go out. We'll go out <laughs> together. Really? I'm, I'll drink with you, right? But the next morning, I'm banging on your door at five in the morning. Let's go. They're not getting Where are we going? <laughs> I hung out with you, now you come hang out with me. Wow. This is what we do, all right, let's go. And we're at the gym, we're working out, right? We hit the bus, we go to practice, we play that night. And they're dead. And they're dead, and they're like, oh, lesson learned. Really? <laughs> lesson learned. So take them out once. Listen, if you're gonna do that, do that, but don't let that compromise what we're here to do. Right. This is why we're here. This is why you're here in the first place. Yeah. Right? And if we're gonna win a championship, we have to have that championship mentality That's and it. work ethic. That's it. So you got to show them, no, Kobe can do that and still has the energy to get up and do this. So either I got to meet that same energy or I got to keep my butt in my Go room. to bed early, yeah. <laughs> also, if you want to have unstoppable confidence, check out my 254 series. They're free. The links to join are in the description below. Or to go play someplace else, to try to chase a championship. That's not me, man. That's not, being, that's not what my career has been about. We all can be masters at our craft, but you have to make sacrifices that come along with making that decision. You start with, what do you want your game to be? What would make your game most unstoppable? My philosophy was a very simple one. I, um, and this is where I think film plays a big part of my life. I, I, you know, Rudy was one of my favorite films growing up. After watching that film, I come to understand if I could work that hard every day, um, with the being blessed with the physical tools that I have, um, what would my career be? And I made a promise to myself from that day that I was going to work that hard every single day so that when I do retire, I have no regrets. And that was the most important thing for me is to leave no stone unturned, get better every single day. And if I live that way, then over time, you know, I'd have something that was beautiful. But that was my philosophy. It seems like a pretty simple one, but, you know, if you live your life to just get better every single day, and do that for 20 years, I mean, what do you have? Here's why practice was important to me. It, not from the, just the standpoint that I enjoyed playing. Like, I enjoyed being there. Um, I enjoy getting better. But as a leader of a team, it's also your responsibility to elevate the rest of the guys. And... What people tend to get stuck on a lot is saying, okay, the way to make players better is to pass them the ball when they're open. That's a very trivial way to look at things. What you have to do is you have to get them emotionally to want to be better. 
You want you, you have to get them to an emotional space where they wake up every morning driven to be the best version of themselves, right? And how do you do that? Right? And in practice, for me, it was a chance to, to drive them, to challenge them, right? If they're and, and this is where you have to know your teammates because if it's late, we just had a back to back and we had practice the next day, and you show up and guys don't feel like going through the motions, don't feel like practicing. It's important to know each and every one of them individually, personally. Because then you know what nerve to touch. Some guys, it's like, okay, come on, let's, you know, we can do this. That'll get them going. Other guys, no. You got to figure out what button to push. You know, Powell was always Spain. If I tell them how they lost in a gold medal to us and how they're going to lose again, how I'm going to beat your ass in practice just like I beat you in a gold medal game, oh, that, oh he would hate that. <laughs> He'd hate that. But that's what practice was. You have to drive them. You absolutely have to. And if practice is more intense and harder than a game seven will be, then a game seven will be easy. But if it's not, then that's when teams start folding and capitulating. And once you have the passion, the thing that you're passionate about now, you can look at other people or other entities or other things or works of art, and you can draw things from that to help you be better at what you do um, by looking for those common denominators. Johnny wanted to know, uh, how do I prepare? How do I prepare? How do I study? How do I view the game? How do you build your game? And you know, my response is much like the way he builds products. You, know, you think sequentially. You know, yeah, you look at this, the, the end result of what you want to create, but in order to create that, there's so many other little things that go into this massive entity that, or, or device. And it's no different than building my basketball game. You start with, what do you want your game to be? what would make your game most unstoppable or hard to deal with. And now you work backwards from there and you start building it one piece at a time, one move at a time, one counter at a time. So there's a lot of similarities there. You just got to have the, uh, the fearlessness to t really take those shots, you know, because you, know, you miss those shots, then you have to deal with the, the, the criticism, you have to deal with... Uh, us talking about it, right? Right. right. Yeah. So, you know, it, and a lot of times a lot of people kind of get a little apprehensive about taking those shots because of that. Right when we mentioned it, it seemed like you started smiling already just <laughs> thinking about the word. Closer. Yeah, well, it, it's, 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 always, uh, it's always been a myth to me as to why um, certain people don't really like those situations because of the, the right. pressure, you know, because we've all lost games before. Mm -hmm. So it's not like by you missing that shot, you're about to face something that you will never face again or haven't faced in the past. You know what I mean? We've all come up short at you know, one time or another. So um, you just got to kind of let it all hang out and you know, trust your skills and trust the work that you put in. You know, I've been with you for a long way. I, I, the one moment that stands out out of, we've done, I don't know how many done, we've done, what, 800 events. Mm -hmm. The one time was 4 a.m. We yeah. went out to practice at 4 a.m. And that was your idea to do it. But, and I mean, then, you know, all these Nike people are like, no, 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 let's not, let's not do that. And then you're like, let's do it at 4 a.m. So you got security, you got brand marketing, sports marketing going, no, 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 let's not do it. You're like, let's do it. Because that's your sustenance. Right? I mean, it, it, to me, it just makes complete sense. Not to us. But I don't like, <laughs> okay, so. See, we, all right. what you, usually, I'm sleeping at 4 a.m. Yeah. You're, you're working out. So well, talk about that. Okay, so if, if, if your job is to try to be the best basketball player you can be, mm -hmm. right? To do that, you have to practice, you have to train, right? You want to train as much as you can, as often as you can. So if you get up at 10 in the morning, train at 11, right? 12, say 12, train at 12, train for two hours, 12 to two. Um, you have to let your body recover. So you eat, recover, whatever. You get back out, you train, start training again at six. Train from six to eight. Right? And now you go home, you shower, you eat dinner, you go to bed, you wake up, you do it again. Right? Those are two sessions. Right? Now imagine you wake up at three, you train at four. You go four to six, come home, breakfast, relax, so, so, blah, blah, blah. Now you're back at it again, nine to 11. Right? You relax, and now all of a sudden you're back at it again, two to four. And now you're back at it again, you know, seven to nine. Look how much more training I have done by simply starting at four. Right? And so now you do that, and as the years go on, the separation that you have with your competitors and your peers just grows larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And by year five or six, doesn't matter how, what kind of work they do in the summer, they're never gonna catch up, because they're five years behind. <laughs> right? So it makes sense to get up and start your day early because you can get more work in. Is that genetic? 
or is that something you you ingrained and trained yourself? No, it was Who just, taught you that. For me, it was just it was just common sense. Like I can I can if I start earlier, I can train more hours, and I know the other guys aren't doing it because I know what their training schedule is, right? So I know if I do this consistently over time. It's, it, the gap's just going to widen and widen and widen and widen and widen, and they won't be able to get that back. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it was just common sense. I'm like thinking, how can I get an advantage? Oh, start earlier. Yeah, let's do that. How do you how do you develop that, or where do you where do you learn that from? Well, I, I think it's just you know it's just a matter of what's important to you, mm -hmm. and what's important to you for for whatever reason. You know, I, I felt like um, I didn't feel good about myself if I wasn't doing everything I could to be the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. If I felt like I left anything on the table, um, it would eat away at me. I wouldn't be able to look myself in the mirror. Right? So the reason why I can retire now and be completely comfortable about it because I know that I've done everything I could to be the best basketball player I could be. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, that's where it comes from for me. You can't leave any stone unturned. When you think about your risk tolerance for failure, how far are you willing to fail? Well, I mean, I, unfortunately and fortunately, I've failed quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I understand that's actually part of the process of succeeding. Um, I'm not one that really believe in failure. I believe you have setbacks. And, you know, you have to learn from those. You have to learn what are those landmines that can be avoided the next time. What are those pitfalls? And you have to learn from that stuff. And um, So you're not welcome those things. It's a part of life. But are you prepared to, like, really fail at something totally new? Like, what if you're just VC? <laughs> then I'm a VC. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and then I work at it, and then I'm not a VC the next year, yeah. or, you know, whenever it happens. Yeah. You know, I, listen, I, my first year in the league on national TV, 18 years old, I, mean, I shot five straight air balls in the playoffs in front of millions of people. Yeah. I think my tolerance is pretty high. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm all right. The passion came from the love for the game. You know, I, I loved everything about it, like the smell of the ball. You love the smell of the ball? Yes, the ball. <laughs> you know, the smell of like brand new sneakers and like the sound the ball makes when it hits the ground. Sneakers yeah, in the, the gym. Sneakers <laughs> <squeaking>. <laughs> yeah, the ball going through the net, like all those things I, I love. And so the passion comes from that because mm -hmm. once you have that love, you just want to be a part of this thing all the time. Is there one moment where you can say it defined your passion for basketball? Is there a story or moment when you said, damn, that was, mm. that was it. That was like when I felt really passionate. No, I, it doesn't, it never leaves. <laughs> it never leaves. Like, I, you know, the game is just a part of me. Um, so it never leaves. Even now that I'm retired, you know, I, I, everything that I've learned from the game of basketball, I've carried it over into life. Mm -hmm. You know, like basketball has helped me be a better person, a better friend, a better How father. So? Well, because there's life lessons that are within the game, mm -hmm. like communication, like unselfishness, um, like attention to detail and um, empathy and compassion. Like all those things are in the game. And uh, as an athlete, if we are aware of those things, mm -hmm. um, it helps us become better human human beings. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that toward your post Post basketball days, retirement into your business world, sure. future ventures. Sure, I mean you can apply. You know, I was applying that um, even while I was playing, just in life outside of the game, and even more so now. You know, in building a business and all these things, you, you know, the kind of culture you want to have. Um, you know, all those things are, are um, directly uh, learned from the game of basketball mm -hmm. for me. When I injured my Achilles and it became something where it's okay, this is this is immediate. Okay? The end of my career could be now. So since I was 21 years old and thinking, okay, I have to figure out what comes next, you kind of brainstorm, you ideate, but you never really execute anything. And when the injury happened, it was like, okay, no, I need to start building now, right? And that's when the turning point was for me. When I'm sitting there and I have the Achilles injury, um, it's, it's one thing to sit there and try to block out the frustrations of being injured, because that's you're constantly tugging yeah. with that, right? As opposed to simply replacing that with a new challenge, mm -hmm. right? Something that gets you excited. So now you're not focused on not being depressed. You're focused on the excitement of building something new. And so uh, it was extremely exciting, man, having to figure something out and build it from the ground up. Do you want to be known? Long term, as Kobe Bryant, the storyteller and business person who happened to be a basketball player, or the basketball player who had a, a successful career thereafter. 
You know, it depends who you talk to. I mean, if well, you talk I'm talking to, to you. A, well, I'm saying if you ask that question to a writer who's never seen a basketball game before, I would yeah. love to be known as a kick-ass storyteller. Right. Right. If you talk to an athlete that doesn't like reading a book or anything, then I like to be known as a phenomenal basketball right. player. Right. Personally, I would love to be both because I am both. Right. right. You can't right. shelf one for the other. I mean, the game has brought me to where I am today. Um, you know, the investment platform, the Brian Steibel platform, the storytelling that we're doing is going to put me where I will be 20 years from now. We, we really want to create something that is epic. And you know, the patience of making sure every detail is cared for, um, making sure you're hitting the proper beats from a plot perspective. Right. You know, the patience, the detail. So hopefully we can create something that is absolutely epic and timeless. And if it isn't timeless, honestly, we won't put it out. You know, when we put it out, it's because we believe that it is, that it is the best work that we can possibly do. What I try to do is just try to be still mm. and understand that things come and go. Emotions come and go. The important thing is to accept them all, to embrace them all. And then you can choose to do with them what you want versus being controlled by emotion. You know, a lot of times I've seen players, even myself, you know, when I was younger, being consumed by a particular fear um, and to the point where you're saying, OK, no, nah, it's it's not good to feel fear. I shouldn't be nervous in this situation like that. And it does nothing but grow versus stepping back and saying, yeah, I, I am nervous about the situation. Yeah, I am fearful about the situation. Well, what am I afraid of? And then you kind of unpack it. Mm. And then it gives you the ability to look at it for really what it is, which is nothing more than your imagination <laughs> running its course, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Because what you're saying is that when you're dealing with something, it's almost like, how can I get to the root of it? Yeah. Because sometimes what we're dealing with, like you're saying, it's an imagination, an illusion. It's not really... It's not, it's not really a thing, yeah. you know? Like you, you think about game-winning shots and or game-winning free throws. And people go to the free throw line and they're nervous about it. Well, what are you really nervous about? If you unpack that, okay, you, you're nervous that you're going to miss the shot. All right, so you missed the shot, then what happens? People are gonna be embarrassed. You're gonna be embarrassed because thousands of people, millions of people see you missed the shot, all right? And then what? People are gonna talk bad about you. Okay, right? And so you're looking at it and you go, are those things even important? <laughs> you know what I mean? If that, if that is my fear, like what, what is, you worried about letting your teammates down? Okay, have you let them down before? Oh, I'm sure, and practice and things of that nature, right? They're still there, Yeah. you know? And so when you're able to unpack it, you kind of look at it for what it is, which is really nothing. There's a quote from uh, one of my English teachers at Lower Marion named uh, uh, Mr. Fisk. He had a great quote that said, rest at the end, not in the middle. And that's something I always live by. You know, I'm not going to rest. I'm going to keep on pushing now. There are a lot of answers that I don't have, even questions that I don't have. But I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going, and I'll figure these things out as we go. Right? And you just continue to build that way. So that, I try to live by that all the time. Rest at the end. Rest at the end. Dreams is, uh, they should be pure. And I, and I think a lot of times, you know, when we're born into this world, we actually wind up going backwards. And it seems like the more we mature, uh, the more responsible our dreams become. And the more governors we put on ourselves and our ability to dream and to reimagine. And it's always a fight for us parents and, you know, and for you guys to make sure that your dreams always stay pure. And so it's not a matter of, of, um, of pushing beyond your limitations or expectations. It's really a matter of protecting your dreams, protecting your imagination. That's really the key. And when you do that, then the world just seems limitless. Shaq's future is certain. A big shift in the balance of power in the NBA as the league's most dominant player is headed back east, the newest member of the Miami Heat. Remember this? I'm going to bring a championship to Miami, I promise. After we split apart, were you trying to get more, more championships than me? Oh, absolutely. You were? Absolutely. And I knew you were going to get one. I knew you were going to get one. Because of the energy, you know, going into Miami and D-Wade and everything that was there, I knew you were going to get that one. So I knew I had to get at least two or three. And the Miami Heat are champions of the basketball world! I wanted you to get that. Because I needed that. I wanted that. Like, I wanted people to say, see, see, this is what they're missing here. This is what they gave up for, right? Kobe should have been the one to go. Now he's in Miami. He's went, I, I, like, I needed that. I wanted that. I wanted everybody to hate me. I wanted to fuel off of that and just come back with so much anger and so much vengeance. So I wanted that. So when you won, um, right after you won, I went out to the track and I ran. 
And I did my conditioning, I did my drills, I woke up the next morning, I hit my weights, I did my thousand shots, I did everything humanly possible to get myself ready. But I, I was, I needed that. I was like, all right, yeah, good, good. I needed it too. <laughs> <laughs> I read a quote that you said you love business as much as basketball. There's yeah. no way that's true. It's a hundred percent true. You, there's no way you love, I mean, basketball was your life, you, your passion, everything. You, you're telling me you love doing business as much. If you could, you know, basically snap a finger and be 25 year old Kobe or the Kobe today, you wouldn't go back and, and keep playing basketball? No, because I've already done it. See, here's the thing. When, when I was playing and, you know, teammates would say, oh, Kobe's not out on the road. What is he doing? You see me on the plane. He's reading. What is he reading? He's writing. What is he writing? Mm -hmm. I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm writing. I'm practicing. I'm understanding how to tell stories. I'm reading Joseph Campbell and how to create arcs, compelling arcs and plots. I'm reading that stuff. So this is going back 15 years, right? So I don't just retire, write dear basketball and luck in the winning an Oscar. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That stuff comes from hard work and from studying for 15 years how to write and how to organize structure right and you can't do that without having a serious love or commitment to the craft at 13 years old you know, i played the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13 it was to be better than you when you know the chips are really on on the line so when we played at 13 i would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are how do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it? Right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths. I'd play to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you going to get better? Right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths. Why? Because you want to win. Right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game. Right? So I have a strategy. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17 and my game is completely well rounded and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17. Mm -hmm. Now you got a problem. That's right. Kind of take us behind uh, kind of the current with Michael. Was there ever a moment that you guys spoke that you felt like it energized you and you learned from him? Yeah, it was, it was crazy, man, because my favorite player was Magic growing up. Mm. And then I quickly realized my father stole all my height and I wasn't going to be a 6'9 <laughs> point guard. So I had to, you know, so looked at this young guy coming up. And the thing that I marveled at wasn't the fact that he was getting to the rim and doing these fancy stuff. It was like, how is he getting to the rim? Mm. How is he doing it? Right? And you look at the footwork, you look at the fundamentals, you look at the spacing, the mm. pacing. Right? And all those little things, the angles. Mm. And that's what becomes fascinating. It's like, okay, how do I get there? Right? So I started studying all those basics. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to the league, the first time I played against him, um, I won his respect because it was like, this kid's not scared of me at all. Mm -hmm. Right? And he saw Kendrick's spirit from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that started a relationship. And it became mm -hmm. something where it was like, you know, text him anytime, hits me right back, mm -hmm. questions, hits me right back, and mm -hmm. we're talking all the time. Where did you get your killer instinct from? Well, yeah, I think a lot of it um, had to do with um, isolation. You know, growing up over there and being the only uh, African-American kid, not being able to speak the language, I gravitated towards the game. And in that game, you find a lot of, um, um, you find solace in the game. And then when you play with kids that you know, might not uh, accept you because you're an outsider, but yet when we come to play the game, that's my chance to, to, to get vengeance on them for not accepting me. The, and that's where it kind of started developing. And, and throughout the course of my life, it's always been that. It's always been the outsider and having to come in and prove, you know, or, or to seek some sort of vengeance when I play. You were so dominant in your whole career, one of the greatest of all time. Was there a weakness that you had? The challenge for me was always uh, compassion and empathy. <laughs> Because you're like, guys, let's go. Get results. Shut up. Don't complain, right? I don't want to hear your whining. I don't want right. to hear it. Don't no tell excuses. Me, don't tell me how rough the water is. Just bring the boat in. You know, I, like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to hear it. You know? And it's, uh, That's funny. it's understanding, like, okay, these guys have lives <laughs> right. outside of here. They have other things happening. They have other yeah. things happening to them that may be affecting the way that they're practicing or the way that they're performing. Right? 
And it was hard for me to understand that because nothing, nothing bothered me. You know, anything personal, anything that never fazed me when I you played. You compartmentalized it. Very well. So I couldn't understand how my teammates couldn't do that either. Uh, until I, you know, so I had to really work on that aspect of it. That's hard. <laughs> Shit. Do you have a mindfulness or meditative practice that you used while you played? Yeah, well, Phil introduced meditation to us when he came um, to our team in 99, 2000. And um, it was something that I instantly gravitated to because I could see the effects. Right? You, I used to watch, you know, studying the games, the Bulls teams. And, um, you know, watching their demeanor, watching their composure. You know, playing in a tough place in like Utah doing the finals and being down 17. But everybody was like this. Right? You couldn't tell if they were down 17 or up 20 or a tie game and never changed. And I was wondering why that is. And that's why I started doing more research. And when Phil came, I immediately gravitated to it and then found myself accepting the challenge of finding what that space is. And for the 81 point game, man, to be honest, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about the game. My knee was hurting so much. Um, I didn't know then, but you know, I had a flap of joint uh, of cartilage stuck in my joint line. And so my mind was really trying to go to a place where I don't feel that pain. And uh, the game started, and because of that, I was just in a different space. You know, I wasn't worried about what was to come. I wasn't worried about what just happened. I was just here. And when you're just there in the moment, playing plays right in front of you, your focus is heightened because nothing else matters. Um, and uh, that's the space I've tried to get to. Do you remember what you told me one day in the forum when I first met you? You said you were going to be the finish it for me. What, the greatest player of all time? Yes. You remember you told me that? No, but that sounds, that sounds something, no, that sounds like it. something that I would say. <laughs> you, you, actually, you actually said that, and then you actually said, I'm going to be the Will Smith of the NBA. This was oh, really? Yeah, and I was like, all right. <laughs> okay, Will, Will Smith. you said. Yeah, times have changed. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not, you know, I've always had ambition. Phil would come to me and say, there was a year there in 03 where I had 40 points in nine straight games, right? Shaq was out. It was a toe thing. So Phil comes to me for the stress says, Kobe, we need you to take over the offense. I'm like, all right, cool. So that literally- Say no more. I got it, <laughs> fine, I got it. So that literally started the streak of 40 straight games, you know, 40 points in nine straight games. Shaq comes back from injury and Phil goes, you know, I still continue to do it, right? And then Phil calls me to his office, goes, hey, you know, we're starting to lose the big fella. What do you mean? Well, he's not getting the attention. You know, this, this 40 point streak it's starting to kind of take away his fire mm. to prove something, right? So I need you to start dialing it back. I'm like, what? <laughs> he says, we're going to lose him, and we need him in June. Okay. All right. We have a game against the Clippers. I think I had like 38 or something like that, and I had a chance to score 40 and to get 40 again. It was a blowout game. I dumped the ball in the shack instead of shooting a wide-open shot. The 40-point streak ended that night. Wow. That was it. And that's inside stuff that people don't know. Right. <laughs> and you tell me you went to Phil's office and said, are you happy yes. now? Yeah. Because Phil was like, hey, we got to dial it back. Got to dial it back. We're you starting to lose the big fella. Perfect Kobe, too. You're like, he's like, you got to dial it back. You're like, all right, I'll score 38 instead of 40. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the streak thing. I would have yeah. been 10 in a row. I would have right. broke a record. Right. Wow. Right. Right. I would have broke the record. But instead, you know. I'll reunite the two of you back together again on Valentine's Day. All right. All right. All right. All right. Hey, what's up, young boy? What's up, man? What's up? Hey, hey. Felt good to play with you again. It did. I had flashbacks. Felt great. It was, the game was real easy. And we read each other very easily. And, um, it was, uh, it was fun to kind of, you know, go back to memory lane. Do you believe him when he says it was all a media ploy by him to grab attention and take pressure off of you? Big chief marketer? Yeah, he yeah, used to say that all the time. He <laughs> used to say that all the time. Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, co-MVPs of All-Star 2009. I know you're not exactly the sentimental type, but when you guys are having the interaction on the court, you feel like old times a little bit. Does it make you a little bit at all wistful for... Being able to play with Shaq, having those those moments. No. <laughs> Sha Shaq. No. <laughs> but do you remember what you did during that game that made me realize I was with you all these years? No. You don't remember? Mm -mm. So we got the co MVP. It's me, mm -hmm. Sharif, and you standing on stage. And what did you tell me to do? You told me to take the trophy home. That's right. Remember yeah. that? 
I did. And I took it home and I gave it to Sharif. Yeah. And I, and I realized now, I was like, I think I may have messed something up. Because a lot of times that our beef was going on, you know me, I'm the master marketer. Mm -hmm. About 60% of the time, I would just say it just to keep it going. But like when you did that, when you didn't have to do that, because you know, usually they take it and they mail it. But right. like Shaq, you know, you, and you know Sharif loves you. Uh, so you know, so here you go, Sharif, and you gave him a trophy. I, I, you know, I just said to myself, I was like, luckily I won three out of four <laughs> with this guy, but I was a to this guy. So I, I owe you an apology. I'm going to give you an apology, but we ain't going to be doing all that crying. No. And all that <laughs> there. But thank you for that moment because uh, uh, Sharif loved that moment. That was the first time I was able you know, to give him something. He was there. I was going through a lot at that time. And, you know, he loved you for it. And I love you for that moment. Yeah, so thank you for that moment. Thank you. When you're going into the league, you're going with a lot of guys that were, you know, same age, same age, you know, same class as you were going in. Yeah. Were you sizing those guys at the same exact way as you did in high school? I did, but you know, in the NBA, <clears throat> it was actually easier. Because what I found in the NBA is a lot of guys played for financial stability. And when they came to the NBA, they got that financial stability. So therefore the passion and the work ethic and the obsession the obsessiveness was gone. So I'm looking at that, I'm like, Oh my God, it's gonna be like taking candy from a baby. And I wonder Mike wins all these fucking championships. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Of and, 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 like, and, and then you had the players that had that passion, but weren't willing to commit their entire lives to doing that, right? It's a choice, right? You have other things, you have family, you have all these other things that you have to do. The game can't really be your number one priority. And so I was just looking at that like, man, I'm, this is gonna be fun. You've always gone at it. What took you a while? What was something in your life that you were shy about originally or that took you a while to go head on with, but then finally you got there and you figured it out? Uh, writing Dear Basketball. That, that was a hard jump, you know, because I, I had, I'd written before. I mean, I, I started writing probably about 17 years ago. And so practicing every day, a lot of things that I, that I wrote were, were ads. And so you write an ad, you nobody looks up at who wrote the ad, right? You can kind of, there's a certain uh, anonymity that comes along with that, right? But writing their basketball was different. You know, it's putting it out there for the world to see. It's trying to create a short film. And uh, I didn't know if I could do it, man. And, uh, you know, it was my daughter who kind of put things in perspective for me, Gianna. She's now 13. And she was like, well, you, know, you always tell us to go for it. So... <laughs> <laughs> she put you on the yeah, spot. She yeah, she put me on the spot. She was like, you're going to talk about it? You're going to be about it, basically. And, you know, and that, that gave me the final push. So that means taking things, using things in your life that, that are scars, using those moments as a weapon, right? Using those as, you know, using basketball as kind of like a vehicle through which to express yourself, right? So it doesn't, so at that moment, for us to face the Celtics again, it's not about the Celtics. It's not about your opponent. It's about you. Mm. It's about you taking your inner struggles and channeling that through the game, right? As a as a as a as a way to to unleash, right? So now it became a matter of how do I express that to them? How do I get them to that point where they figure this out for themselves? Because I can't say, hey, listen, I need you to play harder. So what'd you I do? You. Well, I had to share my story. I had to open up to them and let them know I've dealt with things. This is the things that I use. This is how I go about focus. This is how. I deal with adversity. This is how I deal with, you know, arguing with my wife the day of a game and showing up to the game and still having that focus to be able to play. Like I use those things to open up with them, and then in turn they were able to, um, um, to, to 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 take those stories and and make them their own. Well, you just got to put one foot in front of the other, and you know sometimes I think. Uh, you know, even for myself, it's, it's easy to become distracted a little bit and start trying to look at the final, what the final picture is going to look like. And, you know, when you do that, you can, you can easily become frustrated with where you are at the moment. So, um, you know, my advice is just to focus on each day. And, you know, you have a plan in place of how you want to improve and how you want to get better. And you stick to that plan and, and trust the fact that, you know, every day that you, you know, um, stick to the plan will get you to your end result. No, I mean, it's, it's everybody wants to compete. I think it's, it's knowing how to compete. And also, you know, I, um, you know, true competitive instinct really kicks in when you're down. You know, and like I said, a lot of people are competitive at things that are rolling their way and, you know, um, things that they're naturally good at. 
you know, but it takes a true competitive person to, uh, when things are down like this, to really step up to the plate and go, out, go after it. No, it's, it's of utmost importance. Like, I, I mean, I was such a diehard fan, Laker fan growing up, man. And just my personality, like, it would, for me to ask for a trade or to go play someplace else to try to chase a championship, that's not me, man. That's not being. That's not what my career has been about. That's not who I am, man. You know, I stay with it. You know, stuff that I've been through in my life and been through in my career I mean, just taught me anything. It's the fact that you'll have good moments, you have bad moments, you have great moments, you have horrible moments. You just keep going through all of them, and then things work themselves out. And I've always had some of my best performances on the road. You know, when fans boo, I absolutely love it. I thrive on it. They don't understand who I am. Not only am I comfortable being an outsider, that has become a source of motivation for me. So when I go to these places and you boo, it actually comforts me. <laughs> yeah. I think the best way to prove your, your value is to work, is to learn, is to absorb, um, to be a sponge. Right? But you always want to outwork your potential. You know, as hard as you believe you can work, you can work harder than that. And that's what I tried to do when I first came in the league. But, you know, basketball is such a direct competition sport that me coming in at 17, I hated when, like, my teammates would say, you know, I get hit with an elbow, right? Shaq would hit me with an elbow in practice. And, like, you know, <laughs> you know Nick Van Exel would come up and say, are you okay? I'm like, what? <laughs> hey, Ma, are you okay? <laughs> What's wrong with you? You know, so like I always had that extra chip on my shoulder. So like every day in practice for me was really trying to annihilate everybody that was that I was playing against because I wanted to prove you don't need to babysit me. Like I, I'm fine, <laughs> you know, and uh, and so it's always um, you know, that competitive nature, the work ethic, and curiosity because I asked a lot of questions. You know, playing with Byron Scott, I asked him a lot of questions. Eddie Jones, who was great at chasing guards off the screens, and I didn't understand how to do that. I would sit with him before practice, after practice. Um, Magic, uh, James Worthy, Kurt Rambis, Kareem Abdul, all the Laker greats, I would always sit down and just ask him questions about certain games that I studied growing up. What actually happened there? What did you feel there? Why? You know, Bird tough to defend, why? Because you look slow as to me so he's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like I'm missing something so like tell me what I'm missing you know what I mean and so I would always ask questions and try to learn as much as I could a really critical time where I, you know, I had a summer where I played basketball when I was like 10 or 11 years old in a very prominent summer league in Philadelphia called the Sunny Hill League where my father played my uncle played and they were like all-time greats yeah. and some stuff and Will Chamberlain played in the league you know uh, Earl of Pro Monroe played in the league and here I come playing and I don't score one point the entire summer. Really? Not one. How old were you? 11, 10, 11. And you're playing against other 10, 11 year olds? Uh -huh. or, and you didn't score once? Not one. Were you in the game? I was in the game. How'd you not score? Because I was terrible. Really? <laughs> yeah. That At happened. 10, 11 years old, you were that terrible. Awful. I mean, I, you know, and I had these big knee pads on because I was no. growing really fast. And I had socks all the way up here and I had like the high top skinny, fades, yeah. like skinny. And I scored. Not a free throw, not a nothing, not a lucky shot, not a breakaway layup, zero points. Is that when you think the mentality of hard work started to come in for you at that age when you yeah. failed so miserably, I guess, that summer? I think that's when the idea of understanding a long-term view became important because I wasn't going to catch these kids in a week. I wasn't going to catch them in a year, right? So that's when I sat down and said, okay, this is going to take some thought, all right? Mm -hmm. What do I want to work on first? All right, shooting. All right, let's knock this out. Let's focus on this. Half a year, six months, do nothing but shoot. All right, after that, all right, creating your own shot. And then you focus. So you start, I started creating a menu of things. Mm. When I came back the next summer, I was a little bit better. Right? And a I menu being like, I've got my jump shot from 15. I've got my Yeah, I got my jump away. shot from I've 15. My... I got my three-point shot. Like, just open shots. Not miss open shots, right? right. Be able to shoot it with speed because those kids are so much more athletic. Yeah. And then the next summer I came back, it was a little better. And the summer came back, you the scored. next summer it was a little better. I scored. Yeah, you know, it wasn't much, right. but I scored. And this you know? is 12, 13. 12, 13. And then 14 came around, back half of 13, 14 uh, years old. And then I was just killing everyone. And it happened in two years. And I wasn't expecting it to happen in two years, but it did. Because what I had to do was work on the basics and the fundamentals. Well, they relied on their athleticism mm. and their natural ability. And because I stick to the fundamentals, it just caught up to them. 
And then my body, you know, my knees stopped hurting. I grew into my frame. And, and then your athleticism, once you have the fundamentals, exactly. the hard work, the mindset, and you tack on the exactly. athleticism, then, it's then, game then, over. Then it was game over. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So from 13, you're good, average still? I was, I was good. I was good. good. And then about, about the, like the end of my, third, like right when I was turning 14, I became the best player in the state. At 14? At 14. So from 12 to 14, you went from scoring zero to being the best in the yep. state of all ages. Yep. I mean, we talk about hard work all the time. It's like, you know, man, if you got to get up every single morning and remind yourself how hard you need to work, you probably need to choose a different profession, you know? Because that shouldn't be there. I wake up in the morning excited to get to it. You know, if I'm not training, I'm missing it. If I'm not watching a game of basketball, I miss it. I, you know, there's no place I'd rather be. And if you have that feeling, then you're truly doing what God has put you on this earth to do. My journey began in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. At the age of three years old, my father putting the basketball in my hands and me taking it from there. Basketball was in Kobe's blood. His dad is Joe Jellybean Bryant. He played eight years in the NBA before uprooting his family to take his career overseas. As I grew older, we moved to Italy. While Joe was getting used to playing in Europe, his son was also making an adjustment. In Italy, not many kids were perfecting a jump shot, but Kobe Bryant was. Soccer was a big sport, so they had goalposts underneath the baskets on concrete courts um, where kids used to play soccer all day, and I would be one of them. And then after soccer, I'd stay there for another three, four, five hours just playing basketball. It was a different country with a different language. Even though he had his family, he was essentially alone. So Kobe looked inward and developed the relentless drive to work on his game. When his family moved back to Philadelphia, that time spent alone on the court paid off as Kobe announced his arrival to the basketball world. He was the top high school player in the country, breaking Wilt Chamberlain's scoring records, becoming a celebrity at 16. Kobe's next step may have seemed ambitious, but with his basketball pedigree and work ethic, it was an easy decision. Uh, Kobe Bryant, uh, besides being my talent, to... Uh... my time to the NBA. Kobe Bryant now. He's going to be retiring after I remember the season one. You said, who is this kid? His 20th season, all with the Lakers. He had one of the greatest careers in basketball the history. The just will not allow him to be what he once was any longer. No one understands what it takes to be great. The force that drives you to do what others don't. The sacrifice is made, all with one purpose in mind. Push yourself to become better. The extra seconds, minutes, hours of work put into perfecting one's game. <coughs> Lifting yourself above the rest to make sure your name will forever be synonymous with one word, greatness. What does it take to be great? Work ethic, determination, drive. It takes ability, it takes a desire. Baylor moves on Russell again. Turns and puts up a tremendous field goal. I think it takes years of, of players relying on you to take the big shot, make the great play. You know, do the things that bring success to the team. That's, uh, that's what it's all about. It's getting out and measuring yourself against others. And I think that when you have an attitude like that, that's what I think that's part of greatness. The first I met Kobe, Kobe was just out of high school. He was out here for a workout, and I've never seen anyone work out as hard as, as Kobe. I've never seen anybody that prepared. He was 17 years old and was ready to play NBA basketball. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. I think Jerry West was the one who said this. He said, I want this kid because this kid has more talent than anybody I have playing for me right now. <laughs> and he had a great team. <laughs> this is a kid who would never take a night off. Even if it wasn't going well, it was always going to be trying to uh, slay the dragon. If you don't have that type of work ethic, uh, you don't get to enjoy the benefits. Out to Kobe.
in 2006 against the Toronto Raptors, you scored 81 points, which is second only to Will Chamberlain's 100 points. You know, I always dreamed as a kid that, you know, it was possible to score 80 or 90 or 100. I always just, like, you know, had a dream. You know, like, sometimes you lay down in bed and you visualize things. And you just kind of, you know, just, you know, that's, how, that's at least how I would go to sleep. I'd lay down and I'd imagine playing for the Lakers and I'd imagine what the uniforms look like. I'd imagine where we'd be playing and, you know, the smell of the arena and all sort of stuff. And I would see myself, you know, getting hot, you know, and, you know, score 10 straight points and then but in a dream like why would you ever interrupt that like you're not going to have a dream and be like okay then he misses his next six like it's not going to happen so you just keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming and before I go to sleep I'm like at 120 points you know and so and so when you grow up downloading that into your brain over and over and over and then you know that summer I made a thousand shots a day a thousand right that's on top of weight training and my conditioning I made a thousand shots and it weren't just Shots. It were shots that you saw in that game. They were specific shots. I mean, it was coming out of the corner, going to the pinch post, footwork in the post, coming off the screen. It was very specific. So when you download that into your system and you go out in the, in the court and you're just executing things that you've done thousands of times before and you have that dream, then that becomes possible. Yeah, everything's been, not choreographed, but it's been practiced so many times that it's, it's second just, nature. There, there's, there's, why reinvent it? Like, I, I don't understand that. You go out and play the game, and you're just trying to create something new. No. No, this is what I do. This is what I do extremely well. You're going to have to stop me from doing that. And if you do stop me from doing that, I have a counter to that. Done. Another thing you told me as an 18-year-old, I'm going to be better than Mike. So I knew it definitely drove you. And, you know, it's always going to be there, those comparisons when somebody's come before you and you do it. I mean, I don't know if you patterned the game after him or not. I don't know if you watched him in high school, but there was a lot of similarities. But I know I know that day you passed up Michael Jordan. I know you was probably riding in your car like. You know what, man? I, I thought I would be. But, like, what happened is when I came in the league and I wanted to take him on. Right, I mean, all I heard was, you know, they called him Black Panther, they called him Black Jesus and all this stuff. I said, I want to see what this is about. And, um, but what happened is that we wound up, he wound up becoming a big brother to me. Well, how you doing, man? I know where you're going. You got to get up quick. If you knew where I was going, why you go for the fake? Mike, after you fake the ball, where else you going to go? You left your feet. Yeah, but where else you going to go? In the game, I go for you. I spun all the way around. I go for these ribs right here. He saw something in me that reminded him a lot of himself when he was coming up. And he took me under his wing a lot. And show me a lot of things, taught me a lot of things, a lot of leadership things. Kobe Bryant passes the great Michael Jordan and moves into third on the NBA's all-time scoring list. So when I pass him up, I remember talking to him afterwards and saying, you know, this is kind of, it's, it's you know, like he's still here. The information and the stuff that he's passed on to me, I'm breathing that spirit back into the game all over again, which is a lot of the reason why I try to do that now for the next generation, because he did that for me, Bill Russell did that for me. Jerry West and all these guys, but Michael in particular. What does losing feel like to you? Uh, it's exciting. Why is it exciting? Um, because it means you have different um, ways to get better. There's certain things that you can figure out that you can take advantage of, right? Certain weaknesses that were exposed mm. um, that you need to shore up, right? So it was exciting. I mean, it, I mean it sucks to lose. Right. But at the same time, there are answers there if you just look at them. Because um, you get the information from losing more than from winning, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the answers are there when you win, too. You, you, just, you, you just have to look at them. Yeah. Right? So it's a constant process. It's exciting when you win. It's exciting when you lose because the process should be exactly the same, whether you win or you lose. Is you go back and you look and you find things that you could have done better. You find things that you've done well that worked. You figure out how did they work, why did they work, how can you make them work again. Yeah. And, uh, but the hardest thing is to face that stuff. Um, that's a really, really tough challenge. You mean face it, you mean look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, this is how I showed up, or this is what happened? And, and I'll give you an example. So uh, Katie Lou Samuelson is one of the best college basketball players in the country. She plays at UConn, she's gonna be a senior. Right now. Right now. Yeah. And uh, she's from Huntington Beach, out here by us, and so she comes down and she works with some of my, my, my girls on the team, and she helps coach, and, yeah. and uh, they just had a really tough season last year where they lost to Notre Dame in the final. That's right. Really yeah. tough. First loss in like First loss. years, right? Yeah. And so I asked her, I said, have you watched the Notre Dame game? 
And she was like, no. I said, well, why not? I said, I don't want to watch that. I said, I know you don't, but you're going to play Notre Dame this year, yeah? Yeah. What's the chances you see him again in the final? I said, well, you probably see him again. I said, well, you can't show up and play them without knowing why you lost that one, right? So, you know, it, it, the mistakes that you've made in that game, you have to do the hard stuff and watch that game and study that game to not make those mistakes over and over again just because you weren't brave enough to face it. So she came down to the office. I brought her down to the office and we sat down, we watched that game together. Wow. Right? And you gotta, you gotta deal with face it. Face it. You gotta deal with it. Face it, learn from it. Wow, that must have been cringing for her to just be like, oh, yeah. replaying like we could have won well, all these things. It, that's exactly it, isn't if it? If I just it, did that one thing, if, exactly if right. I didn't get that foul, if that's I scored exactly that layup. Right. That's exactly right. You're looking at it and say, oh, there's the mismatch. Oh, there's the gap. Uh, you know, and all those little things, and it sucks. But, but you don't want to have that feeling again, do you? Right? So you got to really study it, face it. And uh, not to say you'll win the next time you face it, but at least you'll, you'll give yourself a better, a yeah. better chance. What are you most proud of from your 20 seasons? Um, honestly, it, was, uh, it sounds, uh, uh, may sound a little shallow, but I got to say beating the Celtics <laughs> in game seven. Um, hey. That's what I'm most proud of because it, it, was, it was the hardest. Um, you know, you're playing with Rajon Rondo, Paul Pierce, mm -hmm. Kevin Garnett. Mm. All stars. Ray Allen, and you know, it was myself, Powell, and the players that other teams didn't want. And you know, how do we figure out as a group what to do? And the reason why I loved that series so much is that we went down three games to two against Boston. And now you got two games coming home. I remember sitting in the locker room and they beat the crap out of us too that game. So we're sitting in the <laughs> locker room and it's really, really quiet. And I'm sitting there looking around. And we just lost the Celtics in 08. So this is like revenge, right? And they're kicking our butt again, right? So I sit around and I just started laughing. I started laughing. And then I remember uh, Derek Fisher looked at me like, and Lamar looked at me and goes, what, what is funny? I said, dude, they beat the crap out of us. <laughs> they just beat the crap out. I said, I'm, I'm missing the part where that's funny. I said, man, listen, if we start this season and they say, you know, all you have to do is win two games at home and you're NBA champ, would you take that? Yeah. And like, right. Yeah, that's, right. That's all we got to do. Yeah. Go Down home, three, two. win two. We're NBA champions. All we got to do is win two, two games in a row. That's it. We'll take care of the first game, and I promise you, they're not winning game seven on our home floor. It's wow. not happening. And so we all just laughed about it. And then we went out and we figured it out. But that game seven was, we're down 15 points in the fourth quarter, right? And that's when you have to collectively look at each other and say, you know, the spirit of your team must be good. Because at that moment is when teams fracture. And if the energy amongst each other isn't there, that trust isn't there, you're done. Mm. And we were able to collectively dig deep together and say, all right, we're gonna figure this thing out. Wow. And I wasn't playing well, and I wasn't shooting the ball well at all. Um, and so my teammates picked you up and they delivered. Yes. And, yeah. Wow. Yes. The storytelling for me is, is the number one thing. It's writing, it's outlining, it's creating uh, narratives that can inspire the next generation of athletes, right? What are those things? And, you know, and not from uh, merely a documentary perspective, but from a fantasy perspective, from a mythology perspective, right? What are those stories that we can use to teach the next generation of athletes, not just about the sport, but teach them about life through sport? How do we make those connections? And so that's what I obsess over every single day. One thing what I loved about you as an 18 year old is, is you wanted it. A lot of guys on our team didn't want it, but right. you wanted it at, at a 18 year old. And that's why in the Utah game, everybody talks about those air balls. I wasn't mad at you. Kobe Bryant for three, another air ball. He shoots back to back air balls, jazz basketball. And that's why I was the first one to come grab you and say, hey, I know everybody's laughing and giggling out, but one day people will fear you mm -hmm. at the end of the game. So mm -hmm. I knew that about you as an 18 year old. You know, it was, it was fun. Have you noticed a moment where you're like, I can't uh, maybe, I can't be as intense as I was during sports. I can't demand people to be here till midnight or practice without a ball for three hours. Or, yeah, no, know, like, listen, my, my thing is really simple here is that, you know, I expect excellent work. We all do. So I don't care if you're here in the office at 6 a.m. 
and you leave at midnight, if the work that you do is average, then this is not the home for you. Conversely, you cannot be in an office at all and have excellent work. This is the place for you. Mm -hmm. So I don't really care if you're here. You know, there's a lot of guys that get in the gym and work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, but then they can't transition that to 7.30. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? What it was like for you with all of the grit and all of the makeup that you had to be such a great competitor, what was it like for you to play with people that, that weren't as gritty as you were? How did you deal with that? Um, how, how did you set your expectations knowing that, that you were so far out there? Uh, and, and how did you deal with the players that you played with, you know, knowing that they, they were still kind of somewhere on the spectrum, but, uh, but you, were, you were on the top of it? Good question. It's a great question. Um, my response might sound a little um, tough, but I, I, I just, I'd kill him, I'd bury him. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, you know, tolerance for that and the, the kind of culture that the Laker organization stood for winning championships is not tolerated. You're going to show up to play and you're going to lollygag through this scrimmage, through this drill. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to let you know I beat you. And I'm going to want you to reconsider your professional life choice. <laughs> you know, and, and, and for the most part, you know, people will say, okay, that doesn't make a great teammate. Well, I'm not here to be a great teammate. I'm here to help you win championships. So there's a difference. Um, and, you know, fortunately for us and for me, you know, we had an organization that, you know, um, it was championships or nothing. And they were really good about identifying that and bringing players in here that had that competitive streak and, you know, getting rid of the ones that did not. If I got a fight to get you in the gym, that's a problem. That's a problem. You want players that are gym rats, players that want to be in the gym, that want to work. And then from there, you build on top of that. But if you're lazy, man, I don't want to talk to you. I won't deal with you. You don't make me feel dumber. You know, <laughs> you know you're going to lower my level. I don't think so. You can go over there. <laughs> There's plenty of teams in here where you'll fit right in. <laughs> well, you mentioned... At the time, they were right down the hall from us. <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> They were. 96 through 99 was a frustrating point. I don't know about, well, maybe, maybe a little bit for you, but for me, being one of the best bigs in the league and having that title of not winning one. Love, they ain't got one yet. Right. I remember one, one day reading it, reading it in the paper, oh, Shaq's averaging 20 or 30 and doing this, and the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said, well, he didn't win none yet. Right. So is he great? And that just kind of, that just kind of. Yeah. No. Well, I, 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 one thing that you know, um, I understood was your necessity to have to win one. There was a lot of pressure. And I think there was a lot of frustration because you kept seeing this kid and everybody kept saying, okay, be patient with this kid, be patient with this kid. And you're saying, listen, I don't have patience. I have to win now. And this kid needs to develop now. Remember that? I think I can remember the, the, the first time we had our first fight um, and you looked and said, okay, this is crazy. I did say that. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Crazy. Anyway, we're we, it was we we're playing a pickup game. We was doing a lockout season, Southwest College, playing a pickup game. We're on opposite teams, right? And trash talking. Yes. And you kept saying, "Yeah, take that little, take that little." I'm like, I'm looking around. Oh, and me. Yes. <laughs> right. And yeah. I said, "Well, hold on, it ain't gonna be too many more of those little, you know." Yeah, I remember that. And what you say? Well, what you gonna do about it? Uh -huh. well, what you gonna do about it? And then that's the next thing I knew. I saw a big hand coming this way. And I remember going this way, <laughs> and I remember throwing some lollipop <laughs> holding Polynesian came and caught, and then they all just kind of broke us apart, broke yeah. us up. I'm looking at this and I'm saying, man, he wants this thing. He's, it's, it's, it, it affects him, right? I mean, he, he's, it consumes him. And then from that moment on, I knew we spoke the same language. It doesn't matter if we had disagreements with any other, our drive to win, like we have to win. There's, there's no other option. All right, we're gonna figure this out, we're gonna get this done. And, uh, and we did it. Portland has three timeouts left. The Lakers have two. Bryant to shot! How would you explain that mindset of just trying to continuously improve? I enjoy what I do. You know, this is fun for me. You know, I, I, I truly love what I do. And I'm, that's where the passion comes from. That's where the will to get better comes from. 
It's just because I truly enjoy it. I enjoy the preparation. Your high school coach, Greg Donner, uh, it, it says that you might actually be a little embarrassed by how much you love basketball. Yeah. Well, is that true? Probably, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, well, I mean, it's like anything. You know, I, it's, I just so happen to be playing basketball. Like, if I was a computer um, kid, you know, in high school, people would have probably made fun of me. You know what I mean? And it just so happened to be basketball, what I'm passionate about. And, you know, my passion knows no bounds. But it embarrasses you? Well, I mean, it's just a little, a little weird, a little strange. I mean, when you're around, like in, in the Olympics, I'm around other athletes who kind of share that same, you know, that same, mind, same mindset. It's, it's fun to be around them because you can have conversations about those things. I know it's, it's good to say that you want to win the championship every yeah. year, but it probably wasn't really a realistic one. So how do you adjust? How do you adjust as a team leader? I, and then how, <laughs> what conversations does ownership have with the coaches well, and teams about rebuilding? Jeannie, Jeannie um, is so sweet. That she saw me work so hard for so many years. And the last few years, um, her and Rob, who was at the time my agent, um, called me and said, listen, we are so sorry for what happened to this team. We're sorry that we don't have, seriously, it's like we don't, we're sorry we don't have a team around you that can contend for a championship. I mean, you know, it's, it's um, so we can make a few calls and get you on a contending team. Uh, if that's something, because we just feel horrible about seeing you going out there and struggle. Remember this? And, and I said, then I listened. I said, you know, we've known each other for a very long time. I'm, now I'm questioning myself because I'm wondering what about me makes you think I would jump ship? I've been a Laker fan since phew, you know, five years old. I, mean, I, can, I know the Laker history all the way from Minneapolis all, all the way to where it is today. Right? So it's in my blood. And, and this family, her father, um, believing in me and standing by me and all such stuff. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna go anywhere. Like, this is home to me, you know? We work through this stuff together and like, you know, as a leader, you gotta be able to take the good with the bad, man. You can't just, cause the ship's sinking, all of a sudden I'm gonna jump off and swim to another ship like that. You don't do that, right? If you can win championships in front of everybody, then you can miss the playoffs in front of everybody. You gotta be able to take both sides of it. I remember the first practice, we had Travis Knight on the team. And uh, I mean, you proceeded to just annihilate this kid. And you know, just from everything, from talking trash to him to, you know, he was afraid to get on the bus. And um, one thing that I noticed about you from the jump was that you didn't respect people that you could bully. You didn't respect them and you test them and you'd see what they let you get away with and you'd see if they would fold to that. And uh, that was the first thing I observed about you um, and that competitive fire that you had. And then it all started making sense to me. That's how I see him play with that rage when it comes out. And that's how I see guys, when he plays, they back away from him because they're afraid of him. They're afraid of that, that confrontation, that physicality. And, uh, and then I remember you taking me down to Jerry's Deli. Back in the day, we had the big, big flip phones, you know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't have one though. You had one, you put it. I said, man, hey, get one of those, man. That's pretty damn cool. You had, you know, the big, Enjoy it. And just hanging out with you, man, and uh, you showing me the ropes from day one. What are the characteristics that you, you're looking for to bring into your team? Is it much like you want a teammate for the Lakers, those type of, or, or what, are you, what are you looking for specifically? Yeah, the most important thing is curiosity first. I want curious people, people that ask questions, that want to figure things out, figure mm -hmm. out new ways to do things. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the most important thing. And then from that curiosity, having the determination to see that curiosity through, mm -hmm. right? To figure out those steps. And if you figure out, okay, this is a particular course of action that we feel like we should be taking. Has it been done before? No, but that's exciting to me. Let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. Those are the characteristics that I look for. The final question is what's your definition of greatness? Um, I think the definition of greatness is to inspire the people next to you. Yeah, I, I think that's what greatness is or should be. It's, it's not something that's, that, that lives and dies with one person. Mm. It's how can you inspire a person to then in turn inspire another person that yeah. then inspires another person. And that's how you create something that I think lasts forever. Yeah. And uh, I think that's our challenge as people is to, um, is to figure out how our story can impact others and mm. motivate them in a way to create their own greatness. What did you know and learn at the end of your career that you wish you knew at the beginning? Um, understanding empathy 
and compassion. Because right? as a young kid, when I came in the league, it was like, I'm driving this way, and either you're going to be on the train or be on the track. <laughs> right? it, there was no such thing as understanding that people have lives outside of the game, <laughs> which, which you know, I, apparently I did not. Um, but like, if I understood that at an early age, and I, it, it helps me as a leader to communicate better. I came to understand that later, um, and um, getting to know people on a personal level. Um, what are their fears? What are their insecurities? Right? What are their dreams and ambitions, desires, those sorts of things? When you come to understand that about a person, then you can help them reach the best version of themselves. So I wish I'd known that earlier. My favorite Kobe moment is in the finals in Indiana. I file out. Rose's 20-foot jumper, no good rebound, should be Shaq. Smith's got it, loose ball foul, Shaq is out of the game. I'm like, damn, I let the team down again. Mm-hmm. And you and you put your and you put your hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry, big mm-hmm. fella, I got it. Mm-hmm. And you just and you took over. Kobe fires the jumper and gives LA the lead. Shaw running one hander. Fired in and go by Kobe Bryant. Or you can just feel the tension in this building. Reggie off the screen for three. Reggie for the win. No. And that's it. The Lakers take a 3-1 series lead. It doesn't get any better than this, ever. Always knew you was a bad cat, but that moment right there, because you had no fear. I, I was like... Well, you know, I, I knew how much it meant to you. Right? And I, as brothers, you don't, let your, you don't let your brother down. Right? It wasn't my time yet. This championship was yours. Because right? you had worked hard to get us to this point. Right? For your whole career in Orlando and all the disappointments, and here you are. And it's my responsibility to pick that up. Was it a hard decision? Like, I'm going pro, or did you just know? Because A-Rod obviously did the same thing, yeah, um, yeah. you know, as a young kid, 17, 18, going to be a pro athlete. It was a, it was a tough decision. I, I, you know, ultimately, um, the key factor for me was, wasn't whether or not I was ready. It was the fact that if I wasn't ready, I was determined to figure out how to get ready. And ultimately, even if I was ready, I still need to improve anyway, mm-hmm. right? So the work's not going to stop. And it was just a matter of, do you want to come to the league and learn from the best? And I'm doing the math in my head. I'm looking at Stockton, how many years he's playing, Drexler, how many years he's playing, MJ, how many years more he's playing, Hakeem. And these are players that I studied growing up. And the best way to learn from them is to have that jump off of the film, jump off of the page, and see it face to face. That's the best way to learn. Because I had, it was like a database. I had everything in my mind of what they could do, what they didn't like to do, where they did it, when they did it. Now if I could see that up close, that is the greatest form of education that I could possibly receive. So that's when I was like, no, nah, I'm going I'm to go pro. You have a brand, you have a shoe, um, but you've chosen to do something else, something that's, that's more bold, something that you really haven't done before. Can you tell us why you're doing this, why you're going into a creative endeavor like Granity Studios? Um, because I love doing it. I mean, it's, it's that simple. You know, you have to sit and ask yourself what, what is truly going to get you up in the morning, what's going to keep you up at night. And, um, you know, when you find what that answer is, you stay true to that. You know, I've, I've built a brand for the last 20 some years, personal brand, which is great. But that is not where our focus is going to be for the next 50 years. Right? It's what we are doing now. Are we taking a big risk? Yeah. But I think that if we focus on one thing and do that one thing exceptionally well, we won't fail at that one thing. So sometimes you got to put the other stuff to bed and focus on what you believe is, is, uh, is the core of the company. And that always starts from what you love to do the most. What most people don't know is our story goes back when I met you um, in Orlando. In Orlando. Right. You guys had, we're playing the Pacers in the playoffs in 94. And I came to a game, and you know, Penny back then was my role model. And, you know, I looked up to him quite a bit. I asked to take a picture with him. He kind of brushed me off. I remember that. Yeah. You know? And I came to you, asked to take a picture. And you were like, "Yeah, come here, young fella. Yeah, where you from?" You know. I remember that. And uh, that's when it's the first time I met you. I don't know if you know this, but I was in Atlanta, still with the Orlando Magic. Uh, we get a call from from Jerry West and my agent, 2 a.m. Me and Jerome, we out of the club. Jerry West says, I got what you want. At that time, I was asked for 150. I knew I wasn't going to get 150, but Jerry got me 120. So he called me up to the room, 
and he put the piece of paper on the thing. And before I could sign, he stopped me. He said, let me tell you something. I just acquired this kid from Charlotte. You and him are going to get about three or four championships. I was like, who are you talking about? He said, Kobe Brown. I was like, all right, cool. I wasn't worried about none of that. I was just trying to get to that 120 and trying to get to that 120. And that was the first time I, I knew of your greatness. And then when you came in, you was 18, you was doing a lot. And I can remember I can remember one time in the three-on-two drill, you came out on Sean Rooks and you put it between, ding, 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 ding. And Dale said, shh, 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 Kobe, one day you're going to be a great player, but don't ever do that again. Yeah. The people that I've always had issues or problems with, are the people that don't demand excellence for themselves. I won't tolerate that. So that when the career is said and done, they're not going to be looking at you, a player on his team, and saying, you didn't win a championship. No, they're going to be looking here, right? So it's my responsibility to make sure everybody's holding themselves accountable. I'm holding you accountable. If we just played a back-to-back -back and we have practice the next day, your ass better be there tape ready to go. Mm -hmm. Right, because I'm there and I'm ready, and I just got finished lifting weights for two hours. Right, so I hold guys to a higher standard. I was wondering if you've had to tone down your competitiveness and your approach in a new work environment. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, more than a little bit. Yeah. No, it, well, ba it, like I said, basketball is different because it's such a direct competition. Um, and what we do now, there isn't the, mm -hmm. the competitiveness that I. Um, bring to work every day is really helping people, in a sense, be competitive with themselves, right? If you're, if you're animating something or, or um, you're writing a screenplay or you're composing a piece of music, is that the best you can do, right? Don't ask me, don't say, okay, do you approve? Don't ask me, I'm not the musician, I'm not the composer, you know, mm -hmm. right? So the competitiveness is more from an individual perspective. Are you, is this the best you can do and uh, if the answer is yes, then off we go. So it's, it's different. For me, it was, it was um, kind of uh, the perfect series, playing the Celtics, you know? Then beating us in 08, and then, you know, the, having five, I mean, we joke about that a lot, but the most important thing was beating the Celtics because of everything that they meant to this organization. And it was a tough series for me. Most people don't know this, but I had a bone spur in my ankle. And then uh, a couple of games in Boston, I had to leave the game go back in the locker room and get it injected because I could barely walk. And I had a broken finger that I was playing with. I had a cast on my right finger. And then I was having to deal with you know, Garnett, Pierce, um, Ray Allen, uh, Rondo, Rashid Watt, I mean, all these guys. And having to try to figure out how to get through that series. And so um, it was a big relief to win. First and foremost, it was a relief to win and get out of that series a lot. If I lost two to the Celtics, man, I'd I've been miserable. Trivial things weren't going to pull my attention. It had to be things, weren't going to pull my attention. It had to be things that were, I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play. And anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. At, at what age did that goal become crystal clear? That I, made, I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. At 13 years 13 old? 13 years old. That's you the deal I made. crystal clear about it? Crystal clear. And where did inspiration come from? Um, the love of the game, the love of the game, the challenge. Like I, I would watch Magic play, I'd watch Michael play, and I would see them do these unbelievable things. And I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Do you think one of the edge you had over everybody else was the biggest percentage of your focus was on one thing? Mm -hmm. Do you see it that way? Like that was my edge over everybody else? Uh, I do. Um, at the time, I didn't really understand that. Right, so, you know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything, everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. I read a story that you used to play uh, guys to 100. You'd, yeah. you'd, you'd be like, you have to stay in this gym and play me to 100. And I mean, what was the biggest margin of victory you'd ever win at? Uh, well, I, 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 in high school, I used to spy guys 99 to 100. <laughs> no kidding. Um, but, you know, listen, these practices, practices are meant to be competitive. They're meant to be competitive. If your practices aren't more competitive than the games themselves, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And most of these teams and coaches have gotten into a mindset of resting players.
Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a, too much. You know, we're not gonna practice light day, light day, light day. Phil never gave us a light day. Mm-hmm. There's no days off. You show up and you work. Yeah. You practice. Yeah. And practices are going to be worse. They're yeah. gonna be more physical. There's gonna be more trash talking. And I'm gonna let you know. Right? Yeah. If you, you didn't show up today, I'm gonna let you know. Yeah. And it's gonna be embarrassing and you're gonna hate it. Um, but when game seven rolls around the NBA finals, you will be prepared. How do you see dance and other art forms and athletics in alignment with one another? Well, um, there, was a, there was a year we played um, Indiana Pacers in the finals. I rolled my ankle really bad. Mm-hmm. Jalen Rose stepped under me on purpose. Uh-huh. He admits it now, finally. And rolled uh-huh. my ankle really, really bad. I came back, finished the series, um, but I couldn't touch a basketball until mid-September, which was driving me crazy because I couldn't train. Mm-hmm. But I looked at, this was like the 10th time I rolled my ankle in one season. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, I got to address that. And so be, being that I couldn't get on the basketball court, um, what I did was I took tap dancing lessons. <laughs> okay. No kidding. I took Absolutely. tap. And tap was like the best training for me in the world because it strengthened my feet. It changed my rhythm and my approach to the game. I was able to change speeds when I came back the following season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think dancers um, put way more strainer in their body than athletes do. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from that. My daughter took ballet for several years and I would sit there in the class, right? And I didn't know what I was getting into because I don't know anything about ballet, right? But I'm sitting there in the class and I'm watching her and I'm watching her get the first position, the second position. And I'm, start, I'm learning the structure and the rules that go along with that. Mm-hmm. And as athletes, there's a lot to be learned from that. Because if you simply go out there and perform and play, yeah, you'll be great every now and then. But if you play with structure, if you understand the rules that come along with that, the discipline that comes along with that, then you reach another level. But you guys have my respect. If other people that don't see that, that's on them. Thank you. <laughs> what habits allow you to consistently come through in the clutch and specifically when it matters most? Just be calm. Just be calm. You know, sometimes we tend to overhype situations. You know, kind of our imagination gets in our own way. Yeah. You know, and at the time, you know, Brian, D. Wade, a lot of those guys, especially Brian, was still young. Yeah. And hadn't really figured out those pressure situations. And for me, it was, I, was, I was able to detach myself from it and, uh, and, to, allow, and uh, to allow the work that I've put in that practice to manifest itself during the game. Right. right? So there's no need to panic. Like, I've, I've taken these shots thousands and thousands of times before. Right. Nothing changes. Yeah. I've had games that I've won, games that I've lost at the buzzer. You show up the next morning and you get to practice again anyway. Right. Right? So um, not getting in your own way. If I'm buddies with you from high school, if I'm a cousin of yours, what happened to our relationship? How, how did that gravitate when you went into the league and you're, you're determined to become the greatest or you're determined to become one of the greatest? What happens to our relationship? Oh, it suffers. It does suffer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because and you they, understood that. You were well, okay yeah. with that. Well, yeah, and, and the people that love you, like friends and family, like they know that about you. Got it. So they let you be you. And when you reconvene, you know, you pick back up where you left off. Mm-hmm. But make no mistake about it, everything in between is lost, right? So those long-term relationships, the commitment of time of, uh, you know, uh, taking vacation. Like I see a lot of players take vacations with other players that are close friends. And we'll just take vacations just to take vacations or just hang out just to hang out. Like, I, I, I'm not, I never did that. But why, it was a why choice. Not, though? Why, why, why didn't you do that? What, well, because when I retire, I didn't want to have to say, I wish I would have done more. I don't want that. In today's NBA, I mean, you see a guy like Kevin Durant go to Golden State. Yeah. You would never have made that move. No, I wouldn't have. But, you know, different strokes for different folks, man. I, you know, when I was coming up, it was Kobe can't win without Shaq. But I've never heard that argument made about Magic and Kareem. Right. Or Michael and Pip. But, right. But that was, the, that was the thing being thrown my way. And I was like, all right, well, it is what it is. Let's see. You were born in Philadelphia. Yep. Yeah, you spent quite a bit of your time uh, as a child in Italy. Yep. Right? Uh, what was it like having to move away from the States learn a new language, and how did that experience play a role in who you ultimately became? Well, it was, uh, you know, when we moved, I was six, and you know, my sisters were seven and eight, and at the time, we didn't know anything. Right. Right, we were in Philadelphia, we didn't know much. You know, our parents kind of tricked us into saying, well, 
you know, at the age of 12, you could ride around on like a moped and drive around. That got us excited about moving to Italy. Right, so, right. Um, but once we moved over there, it was amazing because we didn't really understand, you know, kind of the, the, the shift that was occurring. Right. You know, you get there, um, you're immediately put into an Italian school right. where nobody speaks English. And uh, you have to adapt. You have to adapt, you have to adjust. And uh, I think it had a way of opening our minds a little bit more to what's possible mm. and uh, being able to, or being willing and comfortable to adapt to new things. Who were some of the guys that you saw and you watched that weren't just driven by the money? Were there some names that you looked at and says, these three guys are as crazy as I am? I do, I, I, at the time I deal with what I've referred to as Goat Mountain. I went to Goat Mountain and I talked to Magic, Michael, Bird, Kim Olajuwon, Jerry West, Oscar Robinson, Bill Russell, you know. So I would talk to them. What did you do? What were your experiences? Michael in particular, he's become my big brother. He's been my big brother since I first came in the league. And what was that process like? So I went to them and started understanding the ins and outs of the game and you know, how they approach things and their level of detail and obsessiveness. And, um, and that's what I did. How did you get that mentality of just being like, I need to get over this. Like I need to get over myself. You know, trial and error. Mm. You know, you grow up and you make game winning shots and it's awesome. You come back the next day and miss a game winning shot and it's misery. And then the next day comes and you're back playing again. And you understand that life has this cyclical nature where it's, you know, what you do on Monday, it's fantastic. But then Tuesday is a bad day. But guess what? There's Wednesday. Yeah. So are we just supposed to live our lives like this the whole time? <laughs> you know, yeah. versus just staying like this and understanding that it's really just a journey of evolution every day. It's just constant improvement, constant curiosity, constantly getting better. The results don't really matter. Uh, it's the figuring out that matters. Yeah, and we all get obsessed about the results. Yeah. Like we get obsessed about like the output, yeah. not the input of not figuring it out and not like changing things. What you said, trial and error, like the experimenting. Yeah. We forget to do that. It's unfortunate, man. Like I, I've seen a lot of players, um, especially now you know, in, in youth basketball dealing with that, um, you have players that are like bigger and faster and stronger and, you know, their coaches are just coaching them for results. You know, we're just going to use your size that because you're bigger than every other 12 year old out there to dominate today. And, and, but they're not growing. Mm. Right. So they're just based on that result, but they're not focused on growing this young child yeah. into becoming a better athlete. And, and through that, teaching them how to become a more well-rounded person. And we're missing that. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that question of the day, I want to know what is the single greatest lesson you learned today from Kobe Bryant? Let me know. Put it down in the comments below. And if you made it this far in a video, you're still here watching. I want to celebrate you because Believe Nation, we don't just watch videos. We do something about it. So if that's you and you commit, you promise you're going to take action immediately after watching this video. Give me a hashtag believe down in the comments and tell me where you're from because I want to celebrate you. Three, two, one. You remember in your, your Jersey retirement, and I'm walking out, and we were in a playoff race in the hunt, and was going south. And we were walking out, and I gave you depth, said, man, I love you, you know, congratulations, everything, and I was just, you know, um, happy for you, you know. But I couldn't help but say, you know, this night, it's made a lot sweeter because I know you have four and I have five. <laughs> <laughs> you God, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I told you I want to do this. Oh yeah. This type of duo, I don't think you'll ever see again. Never, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> All right, we made it. Yes, sir. No problem. <laughs> None of that. None of that. Hold on. We got to take a picture. <laughs> give him five and give me four. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Can you get them all in the picture? <laughs> 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 You too, my man. <laughs> if you want more fire content from Les Brown, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.